Welcome to the very end of Module 6. This is the very last section of our lecture slides, and it's going to cover the very last section of the very last chapter of OpenStax Astronomy. Our goal is to have more of a philosophical discussion of the likelihood of intelligent life in the universe. We're going to pull from our understanding over the course of the semester and apply some critical thinking to this big picture question. So when we think about all of the different sizes and scales and structures that we've been learning about all semester, there is a recurring theme of acknowledging that our location in the universe is not important. We are important, humanity is essential, and that's going to be one of the things that we'll take away from this video too, but our location has nothing special going for it. This big idea of our location not being specifically significant is called the Copernican Principle because it starts with this move from a geocentric model to a heliocentric model. We learned about that kind of background in the early part of our semester where we confronted the idea that um, Earth-centered models dating back to ancient Greece uh, simply didn't fit the observations that we had. The sun is at the center of our solar system and all the planets go around the sun. However, as we have started to understand the scope of the galaxy in this module, we have started to recognize that the solar system is not at the center of the galaxy either. So the solar system is in a big orbit around the center of the galaxy. It takes 220 million years to complete that orbit, but we're not near the center, we're closer to the edge. And then in the previous video, we had a lot of, or two videos ago, we had a lot of big ideas that we distilled down into a finite set of facts. And one of those facts was that the universe is infinite in size, and it does not have an edge, and it definitely does not have a center. So we are not the center of the capital U universe. So if we are not in a special location, then we're kind of confronted with a new paradox, and this is called the Fermi paradox. If there's nothing special about the creation of life and having intelligence, then there should be a detectable network of galactic civilizations of which we would be a part. And so it's the big, big picture question of where is everybody? We're going to have a supplemental video that goes into a lot more depth and a lot more creative animation than I would be able to accomplish that really helps us think about what it is that um, limits the potential for uh, intelligent life. All of the different filters that life had to get through um, on Earth and what that might look like for other planets as well. So as we think about the big picture question of is there life out there, we also want to think about how as humanity would we want to interact with it. So do we want to try to send messages or do we want to try to listen for messages? We've done both um, as a human civilization. So at right is uh, the image that we put on two aluminum plaques, one that went out on uh, the spacecraft Pioneer 10 and another that went out on spacecraft Pioneer 11, both in the 1970s. That has different iconography and you're welcome to click on the link um, in the posted slides to learn about what each of these different um, components is. At the very bottom of the slide, you can see um, the biggest circle on the left represents the sun, and there's a counting system along with relative, not very good relative sizes of our planets, showing anyone who sees this message in a bottle out there that the spacecraft that it's on came from the third rock out, uh, which is, of course, Earth. The golden record uh, is one of my favorite things that humanity has done um, coming together and, and really trying to convey what humanity looks like in a little time capsule. So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were both launched in 1977 and they each contain a record, like the vinyl record kind of thing that you think of, although higher um, quality to survive space. And it contains encoded video, and, not video, images and audio as a kind of time capsule of life on Earth. 
So um, greetings in lots of different languages, snapshots of both um, living things and technologies that we have and scientific progress. And one of the things that I want you to think about is what would you add if we were to make an updated golden record um, of humanity now? And I'm going to read out this quote that's on our slide from um, the message that Jimmy Carter, the active president at the time, included um, on the record. We cast this message into the cosmos. We are attempting to survive our time so we may live into yours. We hope someday, having solved the problems we face, to join a community of galactic civilizations. This record represents our hope and our determination and our goodwill in a vast and awesome universe. All of these messages, both the plaques on the previous slide, the golden record um, described on this one, are an attempt to face the fact that we are in this vast ocean of emptiness in terms of known life forms, and that it is a, um, an act of hope to send a message out, hoping that uh, it will be received at some future time. Because if there are civilizations out there, it gives us a sense that we can survive all of the difficulties that we're currently facing, difficulties that continue to grow um, from one year to the next, and be able to survive our adolescence here on Earth. The other side of the coin for communication um, with potential intelligent life is listening for messages. So the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, is a nonprofit, is a group that has been around for a while, dedicated to the idea that um, if we systematically search for signals that imply intelligence, we may hear one of someone else's message in a bottle that they sent out at some past time. The question that they approach is, are we alone in the universe? And to deal with that question, when the group met for the first time in person, Frank Drake wrote an equation on the board that has since been memorialized in this plaque called the Drake Equation. Let's break down each of these pieces. The first symbol, our subscript star, is the rate of star formation. One of the big reasons to create an equation where we're putting a bunch of factors together is we can use science to make a big question into smaller questions that we actually can approach. So the rate of star formation, back when Drake wrote this original equation in 1961, the best scientific knowledge at the time was that maybe 10 stars in um, the Milky Way galaxy turn on fusion every year. So across hundreds of billions of stars at various stages in their life cycle, including star forming regions, that 10 new stars would form every year. Now our advancing uh, knowledge over the last 50 years suggests that a um, higher optimistic view is more like seven stars per year instead of 10. And if we want to be pessimistic while still having to follow the observations we have, at, at the very smallest count, it would be four stars per year across the entire galaxy. The next um, factor is out of all of these stars that exist, whether new or not, what fraction of them have planets? Now, back in 1961, when the um, idea of finding exoplanets was very young, Drake's best estimate was about half. Half of all stars would have planets. We have so much more knowledge from the um, Kepler mission and beyond that shows us that almost, I mean, statistically, almost all stars should, on average, have a planet. So an optimistic view, while is still tempered to um, scientific observation, is all the way up at the top of the fraction one. A pessimistic view would um, kind of try to manipulate those statistics to say, okay, well, our star has a bunch of planets, but it's still only one star. So maybe only a quarter of stars actually have planets. It's a valid way to think about it if you're trying to be alone in the galaxy, so the fraction would be 0.25, and we can't really go below that based on the observations that we've gained. 
The next uh, part of the uh, equation is the number of planets in the habitable zone, n subscript e. Now, Drake was thinking of our own solar system as a representative si system where Earth is for sure in the habitable zone, and a case could be made for both Venus and Mars at various points in our solar system's history. The pessimistic view, we'd probably still have to say, uh, one, um, maybe fewer uh, star systems have any planets in the habitable zone, but we'll, we'll round it to one for now. And then the optimistic view, we still can't go crazy. Planets can't get um, really, really packed together, so we can't have more than about two or three planets in the habitable zone, and on average it would be closer to one or two. All right, the fourth symbol down, F subscript life. Now, this is based on planets that are already in the habitable zone. Each one of these symbols builds on itself. Of the planets in the habitable zone, what fraction of them have life of any kind, biology of any kind? So back in 1961, Drake said all of them would. If we give it enough time, there's going to be microbes that show up. A pessimistic view would set this way down low, maybe at 1% or 0.01 as a fraction. And then the optimistic view would again stick with the fact that Earth did it. And if, if we don't have any reason to assume that we can't build these um, microbes out of amino acids and other molecules, then we might as well say that it will happen if we give it enough time. Then F subscript I is of the planets that have biological life, which ones will advance to have intelligence, intelligent life? And you can think of intelligence in lots of different ways. There are tons of species on Earth that exhibit intelligence in ways that we're still trying to quantify. Easy ones to point out would be different primates or dolphins or crows and ravens. So we know that it's not just humans that are intelligent, and we also know that our planet did um, create intelligent life, even with the um, strictest definition of intelligence at human level. So Frank Drake was a little more pessimistic about this one. There's a lot of factors that could um, kind of stifle the complexity of life growing the way that it did on Earth. So his estimate was 0.01 um, or 1% of the planets with biology would get intelligence. The pessimistic view would be near that bottom 0.2. And then an, an optimistic option would be that, again, given enough time, we've seen it happen on Earth, so it should be possible that if you have biological life, that you expand out and eventually have intelligent life forms also. Then this next one, F subscript C, the fraction of intelligent systems with interstellar communication. Now, again, we can be very smart, but if we do not decide that technologies that can send signal to space are important, uh, then we might not ever have interstellar communication. And of all of the different life forms that you can think of on Earth that you would consider having intelligence, humans are the only ones with technology that can have interstellar communication. So if we take humans out of the picture, we might have intelligent life, F subscript I, but not um, communications abilities, F subscript C. So an optimistic view is just like on Earth, we know it happened, so we know it can happen, we'll assume it always does. And then the average lifetime of the civilization's communication abilities. This is one where there's a lot more philosophy um, involved. The lifetime of civilization's communication abilities means from the start when we first had signals that went out into space, the creation of radio waves in the 1880s, uh, although it took a little while for us to be broadcasting them um, in the right direction and with the right intensity that it would leave our atmosphere. So we'll say that um, we've only had radio capabilities for maybe 100, 150 years. When we think about what it means to be able to continue to have the technology that we have, all of the different crises that humanity is currently experiencing, um, both political and um, climate, uh, mean that at some point we might survive as a human race, but we may lose the technologies that we currently have. So it's that 
that understanding of how many years do we think that we'll be able over the large scale timeline of uh, humanity to have um, communication. That's one that we don't, we don't know. It's not an easy, it's been this way, so it'll continue to be this way um, for the fraction of life that develops X, Y, or Z. We're still counting that number, and we are the only civilization that we have as a reference point. So a, um, a really, truly optimistic view might be a huge amount of time. We know that at some point the, the sun is going to become a red giant, uh, life on Earth is going to shift and not be viable, but um, we might not even have to stop at 10,000 years. I'll cut it off there so that we can say, maybe the number's bigger, but that at least is consistent with Frank Drake's optimistic view in 1961. So, when we multiply all the numbers in a column together, when Frank Drake did this process for the SETI community in 1961, he said there should be, in our own galaxy, 10 civilizations that are um, able to communicate right in this moment. Uh, so that would include us, right? We can communicate. Um, and nine others. They might be spread so far out in our galaxy that we can't receive their messages. Remember that we are 26,000 light years from the center of our galaxy. That means that if there's a civilization right now, right in this moment near the center of our galaxy, it's sending us a message that will still take 26,000 years to get to us. So it's not that we're planning to have a conversation with any of these civilizations. It is more of a sense of um, kind of hope and wonderment um, that we're thinking about. Now, if we multiply all the pessimistic views together, uh, that would be one out of 10,000 galaxies should have communicating civilizations. We are one of them. So what that number is suggesting is that there's no one to talk to in our galaxy. And that's, that's perfectly fine because in the observable universe alone, there are a hundred billion galaxies. That pessimistic view doesn't tell us that there's no aliens. What it does is it tell us, tells us that there is no opportunity, no chance whatsoever that we will be able to get a message or send one out, which is perfectly valid, um, but it doesn't remove the possibility of, um, of alien life elsewhere. And then the optimistic view is that um, based on kind of scientific reasoning and some hope, uh, there might be 140,000 communicable civilizations per galaxy. That means they would be closer together and there's more likely to be a chance that we can actually receive a message while we still have the technolo technological capabilities for it. 140,000 civilizations spread, spread out over several hundred billion stars is still very small. So there's really not a strong likelihood that we'll find anybody nearby to talk to, but that is still a number that is that is based on scientific reasoning uh, and tells us that we're definitely not alone. Jill Tarter is a huge um, advocate for SETI and is a really important part of the um, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The movie Contact, based on the book by Carl Sagan, um, is based on her life, her real life. She gave an incredible TED Talk in 2009, uh, one of my favorite TED Talks that I've listened to. It's 20 minutes long. I'm not going to have um, it as an assigned video, but I really, really encourage you to listen to it. I think it's incredible, um, and when we have time in class, we often try to watch it in class um, because it is, it is such a powerful message and really uh, highlights what it means to be searching for intelligent life. Now, I want to finish this video and finish this whole semester uh, with a hope that your perspective of our place in the universe has shifted, even a small amount, that you have gained maybe a better appreciation for how rare it is to have life on Earth, how empty space is uh, with us kind of floating in the middle of nothing, 
And in fact, this image here is from the Voyager spacecraft back in the 1970s when the spacecraft cameras uh, took a look back at Earth. And that small dot that you see there is Earth. So I'll leave you with this um, quote by Carl Sagan. I'm not going to read it out loud. I encourage you to either pause the video to read the whole quote or um, the clickable link that will come up will allow you to hear it in Carl Sagan's own voice. Um, so I'm going to display the quote and I just want to say thank you so much for being part of this journey with me and I've really um, valued our time together this semester. Thanks for watching.